Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, since we are in Switzerland, I suggest that we start our plenary session. Uh, it is a, a real pleasure for me to be here in uh, Lugano to take part to this plenary session on conflict of interest and corruption. Uh, my name is Olivier Guillot. I'm a professor of uh, health law and private law at the University of uh, Neuchâtel, where I founded uh, more than 20 years ago an institute of uh, health law. Uh, today we will speak of conflict of interest and uh, corruption. Conflict of interest is really pervasive in, in, in society, in all branches, uh, all uh, economic sectors. So the healthcare uh, is not an exception, but uh, the issue of conflict of interest in the healthcare administration is probably even more acute because this conflict of interest may be deleterious to your health, may be deleterious to public health, and uh, not only to your wallet, uh, as in uh, other sectors of the economy. So we have really to take, uh, to pay attention to the issue of conflict of interest uh, and to try to, try to find ways uh, to uh, alleviate uh, this problem for all actors. Conflict of interest has to do, of course, with financial interest, but not always. Uh, it has even more to do with, with trust. Uh, when you are a patient, you want to trust your physician. Uh, you expect him uh, to act uh, only for your own best interest and uh, you wouldn't like him to pursue other objectives uh, when he treats you. Uh, the population at large also want to trust uh, public officials and uh, health authorities because they must protect and promote uh, common good and especially public health. Uh, and you don't want them to pursue other objectives as well. So to enlighten us on, on this uh, very exciting topic, uh, we uh, have two outstanding speakers this morning. Uh, the first speaker will be uh, Mark Rodwin. Uh, Mark is professor of law at uh, Suffolk University Law School in the United States. And he also is a lab fellow at the Edmund Safra Center for Ethics at Harvard University and he wrote numerous books and papers uh, on conflict of interest, especially the book Medicine, Money and Morals, Physicians' Conflict of Interest, more than 20 years ago. And a few years ago, uh, Conflict of Interest and the Future of Medicine, the United States, France and Japan. And this book was recently translated into French, so uh, I recommend you to read this book, either in French or in English. It's really a fascinating book. Uh, as a second speaker, we will have the chance to hear uh, Marco Bobbio. Marco Bobbio from Torino in uh, Italy. Uh, he formerly was chief of cardiology at the Santa Croce Hospital in uh, Cuneo, also in Piemonte. Uh, and uh, he was also in charge of heart transplant in Torino for many years. And uh, like Mark, he wrote numerous books and articles on conflict of interest. Or, of interest. Uh, for instance, uh, in 1993, uh, the same year as the first book from Mark, uh, a book called Legend de Realta del Colesterol Le labili certezze della medicina, uh, which means legends and truth on cholesterol, the changing certainty, certainties of medicine. And uh, more recently, he wrote a book, uh, Giuro di esercitare la medicina in libertà e indipendenza. Uh, that is, I swear to practice medicine in freedom and uh, independence. So 
I'm really uh, looking forward uh, hearing you both. And uh, I'll give you the floor, Mark, for your talk. Thank you. Buongiorno. Bonjour and hello. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here in Lugano. And I want to uh, ask if you don't hear me clearly or if I could speak too quickly, uh, raise your hand or shout out or something. I'm used to that and, and I'll uh, adjust my speech. So let's start with a direct. Uh, maybe I should start by making sure I have the PowerPoint. Um, and if any of you are interested, I will be glad to send you these uh, PowerPoints so you don't have to take notes as quickly. My email is marcrodwin at gmail.com, and I'll also make it available to the uh, organizers of uh, this conference. So let's start with an idea to give an intuitive idea of what may be involved. And consider an individual judging their own case, uh, either evaluating themselves or a, a legal case. Um, would this be acceptable? Well, a lot of us think that we're quite objective and can evaluate ourselves, and we might be able to. But would it be prudent for society to rely on individuals to judge their own case? And I think most people think then you can't do that or we shouldn't. And since we're speaking about judges, uh, what about a judge or an arbitrator in a private dispute? Um, how would you feel if you knew the arbitrator or judge was an employee paid by the opposing party in the case? You'd feel a little uncomfortable. Um, how about a slightly different situation? What if the judge uh, was a deciding a case of a relative? or a close business associative. Well, we also would worry a little bit about this, and we have legal standards to say that there should be separation and distance to avoid the potential for bias uh, or corruption. So that's the kind of thing that um, I'm going to talk about. Now, I want to distinguish classic corruption from conflicts of interest. By classic corruption, I mean things like bribes, kickbacks, you pay a government official to make a decision in your favor, or you pay uh, a teacher to grade you favorably, or you, you do something to change the outcome. And those are generally condemned um, and often illegal, but not always. Uh, but distinct from this, there's something that I often call um, uh, um, normal corruption, and that is influence. Um, now, just to give an example of medical context of some of these classic corruptions, it used to be the practice of general physicians in the U.S. to get paid to have their f for surgeons to split their surgical fee and pay the referring physician a part of that. Uh, and that helped induce the referrals. And then the codes of ethics decided that that was uh, unacceptable. But there are ways to get around the legal or ethical prohibitions. So for a while, the surgeons would not split their fee. They would hire the referring physician as an assistant to help them in the surgery, although they didn't do that much. Uh, and that you can have avoiding of the classic kickback with the same economic incentive to refer and the same potential for uh, loss of, of uh, objectivity and bias. Um, let me give another example. Take example of a physician and physical therapist. The physical therapist needs referrals of patients. Uh, and the physician tells him, if you give me 45% of your fee, I will send you patients. That actually occurred in the US. It was called the kickback. And at one point, the physical therapist uh, that came out in the lawsuit said, this is illegal. We better clean up our act. So they decided to set up a corporation in which the physician owned 45% and the physical therapist the rest. 
and the physical therapist was an employee. And so there was no kickback, but the doctor still received 45% of the income. So that was a legal means that avoided being a kickback or a bribe, but it had a similar effect. And it turns out there are a lot of financial transactions that can have a similar effect of this illegal classic corruption, and I'm going to speak about them as conflicts of interest. Now, a couple of preliminary points. Conflicts of interest and regulation of conflicts of interest can be a means to control disguised kickbacks. But they can also be a means to deal with something very different, bias. Not where there's a, an actual uh, purchase of, of a change of a decision. And a couple of other points, I'm talking about conflicts of interest mainly in medicine, but this is a problem for all walks of life, and in fact, the legal analysis has started with public officers and finance and other areas, and uh, more recently. So to get a sense of a definition, let's start with the obligations and the doctor-patient relationship. Patients rely on physicians for advice about their medical needs, about what services, about their diagnosis. And we have a societal expectation that physicians will make those clinical choices and advice in the interest of patients. And in fact, there are ethical obligations, but also legal obligations. And we often talk about this in the US as fiduciary obligations, going back to the Latin word, fiducia, fidelity. And over years, there's some um, well-defined uh, uh, obligations of a fiduciary. The difficulty and the problem of conflict of interest arises because when physicians practice medicine and make clinical choices, they affect not only the patient, they also affect typically their own finances and often the money the revenue of hospitals, of third-party providers, insurers, because their choice of clinical decisions will send patients to different uh, providers of services or affect what's paid. And as a result of this, other providers and insurers, uh, suppliers of medical services often try to influence the clinical choices of doctors so that those choices help their interest. Uh, and that's where we get the problem of conflict of interest. Now, let's start with a definition that I've drawn on from law in American and British uh, legal uh, texts, and that also follow the definition in the dictionaries in the US of conflict of interest. We distinguish between two types, financial conflicts of interest, a situation where the physician has a financial interest that may encourage them to breach their obligations to their patients. And a second type, divided loyalty conflicts of interest, where you may have a physician perform other roles. Each role may be perfectly uh, appropriate, but the two together may conflict. So for some examples, Physicians can often increase their income through uh, clinical choices, providing more services if they're per paid fee for service, providing fewer services if they're paid by capitation or with risk sharing formulas. Uh, and if they have financial ties to pharmaceutical firms or other parties, they can often um, uh, uh, earn supplemental income. For divided loyalty conflicts of interest, the clinician who treats the patient might also be a researcher conducting a clinical trial. And you may have a patient who is not doing well in treatment be asked to participate in a clinical trial. The problem is that the patient may think that they're getting medical treatment in the clinical trial if the same doctor is there and uh, asking them to enroll. And the aims of clinical research are to increase knowledge, uh, not to uh, cure, because we don't know the results yet. So both roles are appropriate, but there are many other areas also in medicine where there are conflicting roles. And where the problem is, 
is that those financial and role conflicts of interest can compromise the loyalty of the physician to their patient or bias them, bias their um, uh, judgment so that they're no longer independent. Now, there are many other ways to define conflicts of interest, and Dennis Thompson at the Safra Center, a philosopher, uh, came up with a slightly different version, and it's been adopted by the Institute of Medicine. And he says a conflict is a set of conditions in which professional judgment concerning a primary interest, such as a patient's welfare or validity of research, tends to be unduly influenced by a secondary interest, such as financial gain. And that works quite well for most situations as the definition I've given from the law. Um, what's a little bit different is there's no, nothing stated there explicitly about being a fiduciary or having an obligation. Maybe that's assumed to be in medicine. Uh, and, um, and putting first primary and secondary interest on the same level might be a little bit ambiguous. But since that's widely used, you can also use that as a, a definition. The other thing to keep in mind when we talk about conflict of interest is we do need to define roles and who is the professional supposed to serve. And one of the things that come up now is you can define those roles differently. So many hospitals in the US have conflict of interest policies that specify the doctor should be loyal to the institution. And of course, that may not necessarily mean loyal to the patient. So we need to talk about who is the um, loyalty due in defining a conflict of interest. So the problem is conflicts of interest can bias a doctor to make choices that don't serve the patient interest, that increase services or decrease services or uh, lead to provision of the wrong kind of services or to referrals to less than optimal providers. And obviously, as I've defined it, any financial tie is a conflict of interest. So a cup of coffee bought by a drug firm is a conflict of interest, but so is a grant of uh, half a million dollars. We may want to distinguish between small and large. There's psychology that suggests you can get um, indebted relationships even with small things, but sometimes one needs to focus on the large things. And another point to keep in mind is I'm not saying money is the root of all evil. Um, payment is good and appropriate as long as it's aligned. Uh, so bonuses for quality or for working extra time seems perfectly appropriate and not a conflict of interest. It doesn't seem to be uh, causing uh, a change of conduct inappropriately. And finally, just a word, people are now beginning to talk about non-financial or intellectual conflicts of interest, and that, for those of you who are interested, I can talk about later, but there are some good reasons to focus on financial ones. They're easier to verify. They're more important. Society can deal with things, and that's not to say that it's the, the only kind of issue out there. So the problem is that this can lead to public health problems, patient safety issues, consumer protection issues, and it becomes thus a problem for public management and choice. And it's an issue not only now for individual clinicians, but for institutions. Because in the US, for example, often hospitals or universities are supposed to monitor the conduct of their employees and their conflicts of interest in uh, federally funded research but these institutions now have financial ties through patents and grants with pharmaceutical companies, and so the institution itself can have a conflict of interest, which makes it harder to monitor the conflicts of their um, uh, affiliated. So in my books, I look at five sources of conflict of interest in medicine. One, from entrepreneurship, when the doctor tries to sell services, uh, or, um, and make more money. A second, when the doctor is an employee working for a firm, either a for-profit firm or perhaps even a public employer. A third source depends on the kind of payment, how doctors are paid, whether capitation fee for service or salary can create certain conflicts of interest. 
And then fourth, um, financial ties, and I often distinguish between ties to other providers or to third-party payers, insurers. And each of those can be a source of conflict of interest and a death differently. And there are a number of distinctions to be made because any doctor in private practice that sells his or her own services is an entrepreneur under my definition. But some doctors sell only their own services. But you can sell collateral or supplemental uh, services. So in Switzerland and in Japan, uh, you have doctors that did, can dispense drugs. Uh, in France, you can't. In the US, uh, often, but not always. And depending on the political economy you practice in, you might be able to sell diagnostic tests, procedures, laboratory tests, own clinics, and all of those can expand the scope and range of financial conflict of interest you have. So let's give some images uh, to look at some of the kinds of conflict of interest that exist in practice. And here is a Norman Rockwell portrait uh, from the 1920s, one of our great designers of uh, the doctor-patient relationship, trusting, loving, and uh, low technology, candlesticks and black bag, um, and oh, there's, there's no issue of money, and you take care of the doll, even of uh, the patient. Um, now, in 1950, Rockwell did a second portrait of the doctor-patient relationship, and it's very different. It's colder, it's clinical. The doctor's back is turned, he's dressed in white, and the patient uh, is looking uh, the boy at the medical exam while pulling down his pants. And the, 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 this is called before the shot. It's actually just before the shot in finances in the US when the insurance covered half the public. And you could call this butting in, uh, consumerism or butting consumerism um, uh, disclosure. Um, he didn't do any pictures after this, so I looked for one in 1990, and here's from Healthcare Financial Management about hospital physician relation programs and the doctor is scratching the back of the administrator and vice versa. And this is articles about um, referrals and help making these programs work and merging financial incentives for doctors so that they work in the interest of hospitals. Here's Modern Healthcare magazine and it's a tea party and the doctor's putting coins uh, into the piggy bank of the hospital administrator. And the caption is, Hospitals eager to give, physicians eager to receive. So there's some perception of this, but it's not only in America and it's not only recently, this is Domier. Um, and the Domier doctor is saying, well, um, take good care of yourself um, and um, come back and see me frequently and don't worry, my consultations are completely free. Um, and rub this potion on your leg uh, several times a day That'll be 20 francs for the bottle and uh, 10 centimes for the deposit. So there you have physician dispensing. Um, and there are others at the time. This is about fee-for-service, uh, a provider who's uh, operator who has too much activity, taking out all the teeth, and a modern one uh, of a private clinic in France. The doctor saying, looking at the x-ray, this is, um, uh, we're gonna have to uh, excise this um, uh, wallet as soon as possible. Um, and so you have the entrepreneurial conflict of interest. So this is viewed and understood. Um, and here's in Japan, this is uh, the doctor and the patient vomiting coins. Um, uh, uh, and uh, text about the kind of medicine. And so uh, there's some awareness of these problems across culture, but when the economy changes, you get different things. So here's the doctor saying, we'd like to run some tests to help pay for our expensive new testing machine. Uh, since you have the capital and the scanners and you have to amortize the cost, that means if you fall below the minimum level, you have not enough revenue to pay. And in fact, I've looked at the prospectuses to get physician investors in these, and they often predict how many times you need to need use the machine or for the physician to refer to make this rentable, to make it uh, uh, not a loss. And um, that's one of the problems you get. And we thought in the US for a while, if you eliminate the fee-for-service conflict by having risk sharing and capitation and giving an incentive to reduce services, you would uh, solve the problem. And here's Humpty Dumpty. We say Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty Dumpty together again, the egg, uh, English nursery rhyme. But here, the 
they say he's in an HMO, the egg, the Humpty Dumpty, get a few of the king's horses and some of the king's men only uh, because you want to economize in services. And here's the doctor with ties to a um, uh, uh, pharmaceutical firm who says this weight education, uh, uh, medication has a few side effects for weight gain and the patient asks how and they said the drug company wines and dines me for prescribing it. Um, uh, um, France, uh, continuing medical education being redefined as continuing medical promotion. And all of these are funny, and when you go into my book, there are very detailed statistics on the financing and the numbers and the rate of returns that are less compelling than this. But these capture, in a sense, the problem, and they were aptly put by Charles May in an article in 1960 called Educating Doctors, uh, Selling Drugs by Educating Doctors. Um, and there's a little difference between um, promotion and education. Uh, here's a French cartoon taking off an English cartoon, but you basically have um, a, uh, 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 the order of physicians and big pharma merged, and the question is whether you can um, uh, separate them, what we used to call, uh, I don't know the proper term now, a Siamese twins, it's not politically correct anymore, and, but, uh, um, and the question is whether one will die if you separate it. And here's the physician in, um, uh, like a race car driver with all these sponsors. Do I have five minutes? How many more minutes do I have? I need to know. One more. Okay, 10? All right. Well, okay, good. So um, now the question also is who is calling the shots? And in this case, the doc HMO it holds the doctor puppet that says, take two aspirins and call me in the morning. So one of the problems is, this is not only a problem of physicians, it's a question of where the physicians are in the political economy, because it's the legal and financing system that creates the conflicts of interest for the physician. And if you organize medicine differently, you get fewer or less or different kinds of conflicts. Um, and so that we can't look at this as only an issue of the individual ethics of the doctor. Um, and so that leads me to talk about how to cope with conflicts of interest, because um, I want to say a little bit about that. Now, first, where do we start? And for a long time, this used to be viewed as a problem of ethics and character of doctors. The good doctor following the Hippocratic Oath would or should act appropriately, and that's what you need and you certainly don't want anything else like rules or society. And the professions in many countries viewed this as a weak link, and they developed ethical norms and guidelines because an individual shouldn't or can't decide always on their own. And so you have codes of medical ethics from the AMA and the Ordre de Médecins, the physician orders, and they often did set uh, standards. But the problem is that these organizations represent the profession also, and they may sell, often do have conflicts of interest, and in my books I look at the history of the codes and their ties, and they've done very well generally in certain kinds of conflicts of interest, but not uh, in others. And more recently, for example, in France, um, the Order of Physicians has been having alliances with the pharmaceutical industry to increase pharmaceutical funding for payments to conferences, and so another alternative is to have society, the law, legislatures or courts oversee that with the idea that they are the judge and the profession can't judge its own conflicts and be independent. And so then the question is, what do you do? Because it's one thing to say it's a problem, but is it a solvable problem? And I'd like to distinguish three basic approaches in which one can look at particular measures. You can act to prevent or before the problem. You can try to supervise conduct while there's uh, activity that might be conflicted, or you can try to have afterwards sanctions for misconduct. Because keep in mind, a conflict of interest does not mean that you do betray the loyalty of a patient or others or that you act inappropriately. It's a risk factor. 
it's possible to have a conflict of interest and still act appropriately. It's just that it increases the risk and that there's a threat to trust. So one way to deal with this is to prohibit transactions or activities that have conflicts of interest. You can say physicians can't dispense drugs or medical tests or lab tests or that physicians who advise a medical authority on whether to have a drug on a market can't at the same time have uh, consulting arrangements with pharmaceutical firms. There are a whole range of activities you can say that, that would pro eliminate the conflict of interest because you don't have the roles that have them. There's always a cost to any rule. And in some cases, you may say the prohibition is not worth it because it eliminates too many good things. And so you have to make an assessment. You'll get rid of the conflict of interest, but you'll get rid of something more. And the critics say we throw out the baby with the bathwater. So you have to make uh, an assessment of whether the activity that you value could exist without it. Uh, if you don't want to prohibit, then you could at least disclose or have transparency. Um, and often people like this solution because it doesn't mean you have to do anything that much or to prohibit that much. And um, unfortunately, it doesn't often solve the problem. You still have the conflict and the question is, then do you uh, have people able to make decisions, patients, or behave differently? that will change the situation. And often I think it doesn't, but you have to look at the specifics. If you don't want to go to prohibiting or just disclosing, then you can try to manage or supervise conduct. And there are all sorts of ways that society either removes discretion from physicians so that they can't abuse it, or supervises their conduct, uh, utilization review, monitoring the referrals, regulating prices, as a way to oversee, in some part, conflicts of interest. That, of course, is expensive, too. And then you can just say, well, we won't deal with it that way. We'll have a, a, a liberal economy. But if people act inappropriately, we'll have sanctions or restitutions. And if you look at nations, there are differences. And just to look at, say, physician entrepreneurship, compare the United States, France, and Japan, um, Drug dispensing in the U.S., most states allow it, five don't, but they're oversight, but the managed care company is limited. France, very strict prohibitions. You can't even get a vaccine from your doctor. You have to go to the pharmacy, buy the vaccine, go back to the doctor, and then they inoculate you. Japan, the other end of the spectrum, uh, physicians dispensing and the regulation of it uh, has been now through reducing prices to discourage dispensing and paying a little bit higher if you write a prescription and not having a dispensing fee. Um, but on any number of services, you can make different decisions, and I think I need to finish up. So let me just go back um, to this disclosure issue because I think it's important. And um, this is from the Revue Prescrire. Uh, conflict, disco disp uh, conflict disclosed, conflict disposed or conflict of uh, uh, forgotten. And the problem with disclosure is that it may not, it doesn't usually change the situation. So the challenge for the future is how you manage conflicts of interest uh, and how you make decisions about whether uh, to intervene. And I should end there and leave time for questions. I've already gone over. For those of you interested, there's uh, a French and English book and I'd be glad to give you the slides. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark, for this talk. Uh, you have shown us the difficulty to manage conflict of interest and uh, uh, a number of uh, ideas maybe to, to help uh, mitigating them. Uh, I suggest that we first hear also Marco Bobbio. And then uh, we'll open uh, a time for uh, discussion. So, Marco. Good morning. Thank you for inviting me to this session.
I think it's very useful to have the chance to uh, see the problem of conflict of interest between two points of view, the legal aspect and the clinical aspect. I am a physician, I worked for all my life as a cardiologist, and so I look at a uh, conflict of interest from a point of view of a physician, of course. Uh, I start from uh, a, an article that uh, give a, a very important message. Uh, most published research findings are false. Of course, it's, uh, uh, it's, uh, this uh, is not completely true, <laughs> this, this sort of uh, statement. Uh, but uh, uh, Ioannidis in this article uh, make a, a position uh, evaluating all the studies from a, a statistical and epidemiological point of view. But there are several uh, aspects that uh, can influence uh, the, the information that physicians receive and they use to, to treat the patients. Of course, um, uh, Mark made a, a, a big distinction, uh, distinction between uh, corruption and conflict of interest. Of course, uh, corruption is a, a, a very bad problem for uh, the health system. Uh, it takes many forms, but uh, he said that. And the impact of corruption is always felt by the end user, the sick person who is forced to pay over the odds or who is given unsafe counterfeit medicine. And uh, that's, uh, of course, uh, the, the main uh, issue. Uh, in the last uh, few months, uh, while I was preparing this uh, talk, uh, several articles uh, uh, were published on uh, scientific journals. Researchers is arrested for falsifying his results. Uh, should research fraud be a crime? Uh, corruption, medicine, dirty open secrets, and so on. But what I try to do uh, today is to make a classification of uh, all the bias that uh, can influence the uh, information that physicians receive and the, the information physicians use to uh, prescribe medicine. I divided the biases in uh, four groups. How information is produced, how information is spread out, is validated, is, is promoted. In the last few years, I collected a lot of examples of uh, uh, each of these points, and today I give you some examples. Uh, let's start from uh, um, informa how information is produced. Of course, the, mm, uh, the first point is not to study a, a drug or not to make comparison between drugs uh, because a uh, uh, pharmaceutical industry uh, doesn't want to make head-to-head -head comparisons uh, because they, uh, can, uh, they cannot obtain uh, what they want uh, from the, uh, their study. Uh, of course, there is a sort of independent uh, uh, agencies uh, like the National Health Lung and Blood Institute or some institutions also in Italy that uh, uh, mm, promoted independent study. And for example, the DIG study com mm, comparing uh, digoxin uh, with placebo demonstrated that there, there is no difference at all between mort in mortality between uh, placebo and uh, digoxin. But of course, uh, the producer of digoxin uh, never uh, uh, afforded uh, to, to study, to make a comparison between digoxin and uh, uh, placebo. The second point uh, is uh, to kill a, a study when the result uh, uh, is negative. In this story, um, it's, a, it's a long story that started in 1978 when uh, Betty Dong uh, conducted a study of bioequivalence uh, between levotiroxine and three other generic products. And uh, after, uh, in 1990, she concluded that all four preparations were bioequivalent. Uh, but Boots uh, made a lot of pressure uh, to discredit the study. And uh, when finally, in 1995, the study was uh, submitted to JAMA and was accepted by JAMA, uh, the, the drug company said that uh, 
the data can, uh, cannot be released be, without written consent because there was a, a contract uh, signed by uh, the drug company and the university. So after a court trial, the article was published on JAMA in 1997. So from the end of the study in 1990, it, it took seven years to publish uh, uh, the, the result of the study. Or uh, another way to uh, uh, bias the results is, is the abortion. Uh, sometimes when uh, the, the results uh, during interim analysis, you find that the, um, uh, the drug will not have a, a positive result, you can interrupt the study for commercial reasons. That's uh, the, uh, what happened in the study of comparison between verapamil, beta blockers, and diuretics. And in the editorial, uh, they stated the primary uh, results may have shown that while verapamil was slightly better than beta blockers, diuretics were better than verapamil. The early discontinuation of trials for commercial reasons represent a violation of the declaration of uh, Helsinki. Or uh, data, negative data, can be withheld. Uh, that's a, a, a study published by the Canadian Medical Journal uh, of uh, uh, drugs company experts advise staff to withhold data about SSRI use in children. And they found an internal document advised staff at uh, GSK to withhold clinical trial findings in 1998 that indicated the uh, antidepressant paroxetine had no beneficial effects on treating adolescents. And two studies, the study 329 and the study 377, were uh, both withheld. And uh, of course, mm -hmm. uh, they were negative study that physician couldn't see and so couldn't read. And so they couldn't use this sort of information to decide whether to prescribe an antidepressant to adolescent or not. Or um, the secret agent is, is uh, the, the pharmaceutical uh, agent that uh, uh, work uh, to design a clinical trial and to uh, suggest what kind of patient choose, uh, what, uh, which endpoint choose, uh, what comparators uh, choose, and the duration of follow-up of the study. All of this point can affect the result of the study. I show you some examples. For example, mm, in the, this study, uh, the with the use of aggressive lipid lowering therapy compared with angioplastic, it was demonstrated uh, that uh, uh, the, um, the endpoint was uh, obtaining in 13% of patients who received aggressive uh, lipid therapy and only and in 21% of uh, patients uh, who underwent angioplasty. Mm, but that was done, that was obtained because uh, uh, they used a composite uh, endpoint. Uh, but if you look uh, at the uh, co um, composite endpoint, uh, you see that most of the results uh, were obtained uh, by uh, angina that uh, um, uh, was more frequent in patients uh, who underwent a PTCA. But angina is a subjective uh, symptom. And so since it was an open label study, uh, of course, the, a subjective uh, interpretation of a symptom uh, could be affected uh, by knowing if the patient uh, uh, used a statin or underwent uh, a PTCA. Uh, here again, uh, it's interesting to see that uh, when uh, uh, floxetin was uh, studied against uh, uh, the tricycle drugs, uh, the, the mean dose uh, was uh, higher than when the new SSRI were studied against uh, floxetin. So uh, the, the dosage uh, of the comparator is different when uh, you want to demonstrate that the, the drug is useful or if you want to, to, to demonstrate uh, that uh, has different uh, uh, side effects. And so there are some information, there are a lot of uh, literature on this aspect. 
The second point is how information is spread out. Speed of publication. That's uh, an interesting uh, finding. Um, on, Mar on May 31st, uh, 2001, on New England Journal of Medicine, were publish published uh, two papers regarding the, um, the use of beta blockers in uh, uh, congestive heart failures. The first study on carvedilol has a positive result, so carvedilol demonstrated to reduce the uh, mortality in patients with uh, congestive heart failure. The second one was a, a study with bucindolol, another beta blocker, uh, in which it was demonstrated that uh, uh, bucindolol was not useful to reduce mortality. Well, if you look at the data, <clears throat> the first study ended in uh, March uh, uh, 2000, so it took uh, 15 months for publication. The second one uh, ended in uh, uh, December 1998, so it took 30 months to be published. So when the result is positive, it's published very quickly. When the result is negative, it, it took several months to be published. Here's the reason as an example how information uh, is uh, uh, communicated. Uh, in this study uh, you know, of comparison between gemfibrozil and placebo, there was a, a reduction of ca cardiac event uh, from 2.7% uh, to 4.14%. Uh, uh, so the relative risk reduction is 34%, but the absolute risk reduction in 1.41. Uh, that means that you need to treat 71 patients for five years in order to reduce one event. Using this data, I uh, made in interviews to several general physicians saying, uh, would you prescribe a drug uh, that uh, reduces events by uh, 34%? Or would you like to pres uh, prescribe a drug that reduces in terms in absolute risk of 1.41? Or would you like to prescribe a drug that uh, you need to treat 71 patients in order to uh, reduce, uh, to avoid one event? Well, the results are are here, and you see that uh, when uh, you present the data in terms of uh, relative risk reduction, uh, uh, almost 80% of, of physicians would prescribe the drug, but on, uh, with the other uh, methods that have the same uh, uh, meaning, uh, of course, uh, the, the willingness to prescribe was uh, uh, very low. Here again, the conflict of interest in the debate over calcium channel antagonists. Uh, it was uh, evaluated, uh, they were well evaluated as 70, 70 articles published between 95 and 96 on calcium antagonists. Uh, 30 were supported, supportive, uh, 17 neutral, and 23 uh, critical. Well, at the end of the, uh, the analysis, they found uh, uh, a strong association between authors uh, published uh, positions on the safety of calcium uh, channel antagonists and their financial relationships with pharmaceutical manufacturers. Uh, and here again, well, there are several examples. I, uh, I go, uh, also, I skip some examples, otherwise I will spend all the day. Um, how information uh, is spread out, implementation. Here uh, is an example. Uh, in 1999, it was demonstrated that, that the spironolactone uh, reduced, the, probab uh, uh, reduced the, probab the, the risk of mortality over placebo. Well, they um, made a lot of information uh, to the physician, what, uh, which was the result that after the publication of the study, uh, that's uh, the, uh, the date uh, of the, the publication. There was an increase uh, of admission uh, of patients in hospital for uh, hyperkalemia because one of the side effects of the spironolactone is uh, uh, to produce uh, hyperkalemia. And also uh, there was an increase of mortality uh, for uh, hyperkalemia. So uh, when the information is uh, uh, overwhelming uh, to, um, uh, for positive uh, resu study results, uh, we can uh, uh, obtain uh, uh, negative uh, data. 
Also here, you can see uh, what was done with the promotion of gabapentin, uh, that uh, the uh, uh, gabapentin in the, the United States is approved only uh, for uh, treating epilepsy. But uh, as you can see, epilepsy is only a small part of the amount of uh, uh, gabapentin that is sold in the United States. So uh, the results of the study demonstrated that gabapentin is effective uh, to treat uh, epilepsy, but is uh, uh, used and prescribed for several uh, other reasons. And here again, let's skip all this information. Uh, and here there is another interesting um, article um, uh, by Richard Smith that's uh, saying that medical journals are the extension of marketing arms of pharmaceutical company, and that's the picture that uh, illustrate the, uh, the article. Uh, informa how information is validated. Of course, guidelines uh, are used by physicians all over the world to define whether to uh, use uh, drugs or not, to prescribe uh, a test or not. Uh, but of course, the experts that are invited to write uh, guidelines have a lot of ties with the industry. Mm, and there are several uh, data. For example, in this study, Chowdhury uh, evaluated uh, the mm, relationship between uh, the, uh, the, the experts, the, the, uh, the link of the expert uh, of, uh, who wrote uh, uh, the guidelines uh, with uh, uh, pharmaceutical companies. He said there is a considerable interaction between uh, the autos and the pharmaceutical industry. And uh, if we look at the national report uh, on uh, cholesterol, the third national, uh, and you see the uh, conflict of interest of all the autos, you see that uh, all of them had a lot of uh, ties with industry. So you cannot expect that uh, guidelines are independent if there is this sort of uh, uh, link between um, uh, experts and industry. And uh, the last... Uh, uh, story is uh, uh, it, mm, uh, it happened a couple of uh, years ago when dronedron uh, was uh, studied for atrial fibrillation and uh, after uh, the, mm, uh, the, the study was published, uh, mm, six, uh, mm, uh, six months after the, the study was published, uh, the, mm, uh, the, the uh, uh, new guidelines were prepared. And uh, looking at the guidelines, uh, it was said that despite le the limits of the evidence, all three guidelines recommended dr dronedaron from prevention of recurrence of atrial fibrillation. Two of the guidelines recommended it as a rate control agent. So there was no evidence, but the guidelines suggested to use it. And finally, how information is promoted. Uh, here I uh, give you uh, a data uh, very interesting. Uh, Orlowski uh, analyzed uh, how physician uh, prescribed a, a, a drug before and after in some symposium. Uh, before and, and after a symposium on, uh, um, on intravenous antibiotic, and as you see, the, uh, the number of drugs prescribed in the six months before and afterwards increased so, uh, very much, and also for a new cardiovascular drug. And, uh, mm, uh, but uh, then he asked to those physicians if the enticement of participating at this symposium influenced uh, their pre uh, prescription patterns. And uh, the 85% uh, said no, and uh, only 15% said yes. So uh, they don't perceive the risk of uh, uh, influence of, mm, of uh, information by the industry. Let's skip this one. Uh, and I give you some uh, uh, titles uh, dis uh, discussing uh, the, the link between uh, the education and uh, uh, um, a conflict of interest. And then uh, we arrive here mm, that uh, uh, a couple of years ago, on um, New England Journal of Medicine, it was uh, uh, 
conducted, they published a study that was conducted to see if uh, uh, the declaration of conflict of interest influenced the reader. So, so if physicians uh, interpret uh, di uh, differently the, the result of a study, if they, they know there is a link between the author and uh, the company. Well, uh, the result is that uh, uh, industry sponsor, uh, sponsorship negatively influence uh, the perception of methodological quality and reduce the, their willingness to, uh, to believe and act on trial findings. And uh, uh, finally, this, was, this is a study that was published uh, three days ago on JAM um, of Internal Medicine. Mm, studying the, the relationship uh, between industry and uh, um, authors of uh, randomized controlled trials. And they say that uh, our results suggest that in addition to disclosure of industry funding source, a greater transparency of industry funders' role in the trial design, analysis, and reporting might be valuable for assessing potential bias in trial findings. And so we arrive uh, at the conclusion of this talk, uh, trying to find some tentative conclusions. So I agree with Mark that uh, a conflict of interest uh, is a, a big issue. Uh, of course, it's not as big as, as, as corruption, but uh, uh, conflict of interest influences all information that the physician receive. So uh, the information physicians use to prescribe drugs uh, is uh, mm, uh, influenced by uh, the results uh, of uh, um, the, the conflict of interest. So what we can do is to reduce physician representative relationships, uh, make disclosure of uh, on any type, open access to research data, independent info to uh, increase independent information and research, of course, and uh, tell physicians that uh, uh, conflict of interest uh, is uh, uh, a risk factor. So uh, I think uh, living and working with physicians, uh, spend, uh, spending all my life uh, working with physicians, that they don't perceive uh, the, the risk that uh, the conflict of interest can affect their independence and uh, um, uh, how they treat the patient. And so I think that uh, uh, it would be very important to, um, uh, to tell physicians to be very careful uh, any time they make a, a, a connection with uh, any sort of, of industry that works in the health system. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Marco, for drawing this uh, very interesting but a bit gloomy picture of uh, medical research. Uh, I mean, who, who can trust a physician? <laughs> uh, but I'm sure that uh, the two talks uh, will raise a number of questions. Uh, maybe I have a first question and then I will uh, give you the opportunity to to ask questions also to our two uh, speakers. Uh, you alluded to a number of solutions, both of you. Uh, you both spoke of disclosure and transparency. Uh, Mark, you seemed rather skeptical uh, about uh, the effect of disclosure. And uh, do you think, Marco, that disclosure is uh, uh, part of the solution? And no. uh, I would like also Mark to uh, go a bit further on this uh, issue of disclosure. Mm. Uh, I don't think so. Uh, I think it's important mm, mm, to, to know if uh, uh, the, the expert who write the clinical guidelines have uh, uh, ties with the industry. And uh, it's, it's, it's important to know uh, if uh, in a uh, randomized controlled trial there is also uh, uh, some of the authors are uh, um, people from a company. Because as you see uh, from the, uh, the study that I presented from the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, if you uh, see that uh, there are some ties, uh, uh, you reduce the trust uh, in the results. And so you look at the results uh, with uh, a more uh, critical way. Uh, 
Well, I don't want to sound like I'm uh, standing up for secrecy, because that's not what I'm saying. But it's interesting that in the American Medical uh, Association debate in the early 20th century, there was a debate about whether to make prohibit kickbacks or require that they be disclosed. And one branch said, as long as you disclose it, it's fine to split fees. And the other group said, well, no, you know, that the problem is not that it's secret. And so there you have it, and it's come up um, more recently. Now, some people think it's magic. You disclose it, and somehow everything goes away. Um, but you need to think, what changes when you have disclosed the conflict of interest? And if the problem is that the judgment of the physician or the journal or whatever is biased, the fact that you disclose it often doesn't change anything. Now, we often use disclosure in other contexts to allow individuals to choose. So if you know that someone has a conflict of interest, in theory the patient can go to another doctor, but that's not very practical often. It's costly, you can't do it, and a second opinion may not want to contradict the first opinion. You may not have uh, the option. And so, in fact, in certain cases, the studies now show that disclosure makes things worse. Um, you can prompt physicians to think that they have fulfilled their ethical obligations, so now they can act in their own self-interest because they've disclosed it. There's also psychological studies that suggest that when people hear of disclosure, they have confidence and greater confidence, so then they trust. So it's an empirical question as well as a conceptual question, but I think a lot of people have moved toward promoting disclosure because it looks like you're doing something, but you don't have to change that much. And in fact, we also know it's very hard to make disclosure work. You can disclose things in a way that uh, looks like advertising. So you don't warn people of the risk, you make it look like you're better because you're an expert that consults for all the companies. You're very prestigious. Um, you can, uh, also it's very hard to actually get people to disclose or to disclose accurately. And the studies that have been done shown that the information is not accurate. So it's a nice tool and it's a nice beginning. And in certain contexts where you feel that you can't intervene to manage specifically or that you can't get rid of the conflict of interest because it's so costly and disruptive, maybe that's when it's useful. But always ask, what does it do, what is it changing, and what is an alternative way and how that would compare? Hmm. But don't you think that disclosure might be more effective if uh, the professional culture was different? Because physicians for how long have been used to these kind of uh, kickbacks and uh, other financial incentives? And uh, as long as you don't change the professional culture, uh, all the, the solutions, whether a legal one, a code of professional conduct or transparency, will never be fully effective. Yeah, well, I, again, I'm not, um, here's a couple examples that I don't think are realized, but where I think disclosure has great value. Um, when you have information, you can then have further uh, advocating to change the system. So in the US, we have a group called ProPublica, a public interest um, uh, research firm, uh, investigative reportings, and they've taken all the data disclosed under the uh, Sunshine Act on physician payment and they display it so you can look up your doctor and you can look up the hospital. And the issue is not so much that you can then as an individual make a choice because it's very confusing, but it's generated hundreds of articles in the press. And that then may agitate for other changes. So sometimes you need to disclose to get other action. And I think that's um, a, a great, and positive thing of transparency. Mm -hmm. But I'm worried that it can normalize the situation. And so now one of the problems is you say, well, everyone's getting some payments and, ha and it's very hard to figure out what, what to do. Um, uh, so um, I'd say at least one cheer for disclosure, maybe two, but not, not three. <laughs>
Okay, I would like to give uh, you the opportunity to, to ask uh, the many questions and uh, undoubtedly you have for our two speakers. Uh, who would like to ask a question? Yes. For two very rich talks. Um, I was struck by the study that Marco Bobby has cited of the early 90s that awareness that conflicts of interest can in fact affect my mm -hmm. practice is so low. I'm thinking of the study by Aaron Kesselheim et al. And I'm wondering, I think it's one thing to force people you know, to disclose and people may comply more and more because you're more stringent and you know, making people just do it. But I think it's another thing to really be convinced yourself that this can affect your very own practice. And I'm wondering, do you have any indication um, that this finding that so few physicians actually realize that if they, you know, if they are coached by the pharmaceutical industry, that this is going to affect their prescribing behavior. Do you think in the past 20 years, you know, with all the sensitization going on, do you think this fundamental awareness has changed of there being an issue of physicians really being convinced that they can be affected? Uh, yes, I'm sure that uh, in the last 20 years, uh, uh, the perception uh, of the, the influence of conflict of interest changed very much uh, all over the world. Uh, I don't know, uh, of course, Mark can tell better about uh, what happened in the United States, Japan, and France because he studied this uh, aspect. But in Italy, it changed uh, very much. Um, 10, 15 years ago, nobody uh, used the expression uh, conflict of interest. Now, uh, all the physicians know uh, that's uh, uh, a problem, and, uh, mm, and of course, uh, they try to deal with it. Uh, of course, uh, that doesn't mean that uh, it changed completely the influence of industry on uh, the, the mm, pre partner prescription of uh, physicians, but in some way, there was a much more concern, and. Uh, uh, so, uh, also because uh, uh, in, uh, also in national meetings of the cardiologist, of the oncologist, there were uh, meetings uh, discussing conflict of interest. So, uh, nowadays, all physician uh, knows the problem. O of course, uh, the, uh, it's uh, completely different to know a problem and to act uh, uh, consequently, uh, because. Uh, Mm, why there is a conflict of interest? Because there is an interest, and the interest of money is pretty strong, and so it's difficult to, uh, to defeat. We have to, to deal with conflict uh, of interest. We cannot uh, avoid completely, but uh, we can try to deal with it and to uh, uh, avoid that uh, make uh, uh, big problems in the relationship between uh, a physician and the patient. Mark, would you like to um, add something? Well, just that um, there has been a, a change, um, and I think we owe a debt of gratitude to Dr. Arnold Relman, who first in the medical profession started talking about these things in 1980 in some editorials on dealing with conflicts of interest and uh, for-profit medicine, because um, until then, it wasn't discussed um, as explicitly. Um, and, or only in editorials. Now, uh, let me back up a little because early in the century, the American Medical Association discussed fee splitting and other commercial I issues in the 1890s, 1920s, but they didn't use the term conflict of interest, so it's not as if we had uh, nothing. But then there was a period of silence from the 1950s on when the American medical profession explicitly decided not to talk about it, and they fought with the American College of Physicians, which came out against fee splitting and said, please don't do this anymore, and they even disciplined some of their members who um, spoke to the press. And Arnold Relman made this a respectable thing for doctors to talk about, and that helped spur under Jerry Kassirer and Marsha Angel empirical studies of conflicts of interest to measure, and it's become now an acceptable part of a medical academic career to study this, whereas before it was only a kind of a minor a sideline when you wore your ethical cap and in the evening after dinner and had conversations. Um, and the other thing that's changed is it's no longer up to physicians anymore. Policymakers and insurers are beginning to get involved. 
um, and, and make uh, some decisions, sometimes explicitly, sometimes uh, uh, implicitly through other forms of regulation. So it's now on the agenda. It may not be managed well, but I think it's going to, uh, there's, it's, I don't think it's going to go away for a, a long time. And we need tools and the activities of others as well as the medical profession to deal with this because I come back to the same image. You can't always only judge your own case. You need others um, uh, to be involved. Another question? Yes. Luca. I, I have two questions. Um, first of all, in, in the 90s, I wrote my PhD on uh, double agency. So you, you have spoken about um, the fact that uh, conflict of interest means that a doctor uh, has a certain loyalty not only to the patient but to other third parties. But I think there is, a, in my view, a healthy conflict of interest, which is the conflict of interest between the interest of the individual and the interest of the community, the individual health and the public health. So my first question, how you can imagine to reconcile in a healthy way this um, commitment to both uh, the patient and the community or the society. The second point, uh, I'm completely, I completely agree with Marco uh, when uh, the problem is uh, in the field of research, in the field of uh, producing uh, uh, information, disseminating information, then uh, it's such a huge problem Then you need uh, institutional arrangements. You cannot solve it in a different way. You're, but uh, if we come to the very intimate relationship between uh, the patient and the doctor, so what for a long time economists suggested was uh, to solve the problem by using what we call um, extrinsic uh, motivational uh, designs. So to, to rely more and more on incentives control and uh, bureaucratic uh, systems to solve this conflict of, of interest. But what we know uh, after 20 years of this, or 30 years of this uh, improvement, is that there is a crowding out going on. So the, the intrinsic part, which has something to do with ethics, with uh, uh, the professional um, uh, understanding, can be eroded. So at the end, to get the same result, if, you, if the social norms are, uh, are reduced, because once you, you introduce this kind of incentives, you send a message around that uh, trust is not uh, anymore uh, a value, that you, you cannot trust the physicians. And I think this has, um, on, on, uh, on the colleague, a very strong impact. I am the, on, the, the last one who is uh, behaving in a loyal way to the patient. So the second question is, how can we design uh, so the institutional uh, solutions that you have in mind without crowding out uh, the social norms? Well, um, on, on, um, on double agency, it's definitely an issue. And as I mentioned, I, there are these dual roles, and both may be perfectly acceptable. So sometimes, for some of them, you may separate. So a physician who's trying to develop guidelines about practice may be in a role of balancing uh, individual and social and thinking about what makes sense from a social point of view, cost effectiveness. But when she's in the office treating a patient, then I think the obligation should be to care for the patient in front of them, subject to whatever social constraints reimbursement constraints and guidelines that exist that make some balancing issues. It's obviously a bit more complex than that, and there's a whole literature on bedside rationing and the like, um, but I don't have a quick uh, 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 solution for that. And, um, but that gets to your second point, and I think it's very American to think that we can manage things to just have different incentives. So we'll just tweak the incentives and the reimbursement and have a, a blended payment and adjust a bit more. But the very fact that you tell people, as you say, 
that we're giving you an incentive to change your conduct may change the internal professional norms and ask people to think about their own interest and, and that's very dangerous too. And so there may be some benefits of to having a more neutral payment and salary and then trying to change uh, and affect social norms and behavior rather than developing the perfect um, uh, compensation system that has a little bit of incentive to reduce services and a little bit for quality and a little bit for uh, effort and, and, and all those things. Um, I hope to get into some of those issues in my course, but it's hard to do in a sh short time here. I think that uh, you, Oliver, you can make some consideration regarding the first uh, uh, question of uh, Luca. Uh, the, between the <coughs> relationship between the individual and the social, uh, uh, the conflict of uh, treating an individual uh, that's uh, against uh, the, uh, the community or uh, vice versa, some treatment that uh, are useful for the community, but not useful for the single patient. So it's an ethical aspect. It's one. Yeah, true. Uh, but uh, I, of the same position as Mark. I mean, uh, when the physician is at the bedside, uh, he has a fiduciary duty to his patient, and so his patient health should he should be his primary consideration. Uh, when he is a public health uh, physician. Uh, of course, he will think differently, uh, but uh, of course the same person uh, sometimes, maybe in both situations, but usually not at the same time. So he has to switch from uh, one perspective to the other. I, I, it's, it's probably not easy, and probably people think they can do that uh, easily, but uh, as it was said before, uh, we uh, are not able to really to be good judges uh, for our own behaviors. Uh, but there is no, so no easy solution to that, I mean, uh, because both interests are valuable interests and uh, you have to, to take them into account. And there was another question. Yes. My name is Judith Richter, and I've worked in international public health. So I want to lift it out a bit from the normal medical economy and put it at the political level and actually at the highest level, which means the United Nations level, where people tried to do various regulatory frameworks around industries. The infant food case is maybe most known, and here I maybe want to ask also why uh, there is not maybe not enough mention of the role of society, namely the consumer groups, which often brought the issues into the media, which did boycotts and other such means of social naming and shaming if there is no regulation and bringing the issues on the agenda. So one comment from there would already be, Marco, you say, you think corruption is more of a problem as conflicts of interest. I would see it a bit differently. I would see when, when society started to really criminalize corruption and have, have ways of dealing with it, these conflicts of interest became, situations became much more widespread and the risk is really that people think they, it doesn't affect their judgment and also people are now proposing to increase integrity and ethics um, e education of uh, physicians to deal with the problem, which is inappropriate from all you discussed. But I wanted to say also, what does industry do to influence our politics? So I did a study of what they do when the WHO tried, for example, to regulate the marketing practices of the infant food industry and altogether the pharmaceutical sector. We had a code for the pharmaceutical sector. It was established by UNCTAD. It was pushed off the agenda, not just by the industry, but by our states talking in the interest of industry. I have to mention, unfortunately, the United States here in the international debates 
the United States were more or less really representing the interests of the pharmaceutical and other industries. The latest industries are the industries which are producing junk food and drinks which uh, create the obesity problem. So I studied what was called in the old days engineering of consent. People had no problem to call it that way at the time. Currently it's called issues management. And one very important strategy is fudge the issue. So I was a bit worried to, talk, to hear talk about counterfeit drugs. <laughs> counterfeit drugs is not a safety risk, it's a patent issue. It started out at the WHO level as one of the essential drug policies which talked about substandard drugs, the problem of substandard drugs for patients. The proposal was to set up labs in all developing countries to help them test the quality of drugs. It now ended after the pharmaceutical industry entered the debate as partner in all these debates. It ended out as a big campaign against counterfeit drugs. Result is, first of all, incredible links between the pharmaceutical industry and everybody here in Switzerland. We have a partnership with the pharmaceutical association to work against the problem of counterfeit drugs. It ends with countries stopping generic drugs produced in India, for example, meant for other developing countries in Western countries because it is against the laws on counterfeit drugs. It's a health risk, the campaign against counterfeit drugs. So I would like, when we talk, I think one of the means is we should educate not only physicians, but everybody about the manipulative strategies of the industries not only of the marketing um, kind of uh, manipulation, but really also political manipulation. So of course, uh, that's a, a very big issue. Uh, I, mm, I always focused my attention to, uh, at the physician level, not at the national level. So I have no data. I, I read a lot of uh, uh, problems regarding the, the influence of the industry on, on nations. Uh, uh, but uh, I have no data and I cannot uh, give you uh, new information. Uh, regarding your, um, what you said uh, at the beginning, I think that uh, um, conflict of interest is a, a real um, a problem uh, because it's not uh, fully perceived uh, by physicians. That's uh, the real uh, risk uh, of the, the, the conflict of interest. Because corruption, anyone knows that, that corruption is bad, but uh, conflict of interest is uh, often uh, perceived as something that uh, you, you can do it because everyone has some sort of conflict of interest. It's difficult to define the level of conflict of interest and so it's not perceived uh, as a real risk for the, the health system. So, Judith, I agree with you. There are problems at several levels and it, uh, one problem is a physician's judgment and that's a useful empirical choice. We'd like things to work well. But even if the physician acts in a way that's neutral or in the interest, they depend on the knowledge base. And as Marcos pointed out, if the knowledge is corrupted, they can have the best intentions and the best analysis, but their results will flawed. And then as you point out at the national level, whatever policies, regulatory policies we have uh, also may bias the situation and have uh, bad effects. And so I've recently started working on what I call institutional corruption um, and ph pharmaceutical policy because I, I agree with you that uh, there are um, things that weaken the effectiveness of institutions that are supposed to protect the public and that's a whole other area. So there's a lot of work to be done um, and we'll have to uh, work different parts at different times. Yes? Thank you very much. My name is Lida Alhutska and I work for the International Baby Food Action Network. Thank you both very much for your presentation and I want to come back to you on two points with two questions. 
First, Mark, to you. You said there are many different types of conflicts of interest and that it may make sense for people to focus on financial or financial generated conflicts of interest. But you also mentioned intellectual conflicts of interest. And I really want you to please elaborate a little bit on that because we have been hearing the argument that everybody has a conflict of interest and people have intellectual conflicts of interest, so don't talk to us only about influence by the big pharma or any other industry through financial ties, because basically this is a very complex field and uh, in any policy making, intellectual conflicts of interest are always raised as very serious ones, which also the NGOs have and the academia people have and so, you know, trying basically to blur the, the picture and trying to make the financial uh, influence uh, and that causes conflicts of interest sort of go away through showing all the other ones. The second question or remark is, I agree that if physicians become more, uh, or anybody else for that matter, more uh, knowledgeable about who is behind the studies that are published, behind the articles, how these uh, studies were funded, uh, what is the role of the researchers vis-a-vis, -vis, for example, the industry that is producing the drug that is being reported on. They may read the articles differently and make a better judgment about the value of the results. But uh, I think uh, also saying doctors to be more aware of conflicts of interest it is a good thing, but it does not solve the whole problem because we know about the sort of insidious nature, how conflicts of interest are created and how many, perhaps all of us here in the auditorium would say, well, it concerns the other person, it concerns the others, but not me, I'm aware of it. I can prevent it. So if you could comment on the notion of how one person, even aware of conflicts of interest, can that person fall into the trap or can we always prevent it through just very rational thinking about it and acting on it? Okay, Thank yes. you. Okay. Who will start? <laughs> uh, well, I think it's a, a, a big issue uh, because of, of course it deals with a psychological aspect. Uh, the, as I showed you, uh, if uh, you ask a physician uh, this uh, meeting, this uh, uh, drug representative influenced uh, uh, your uh, pre uh, um, prescribing pattern, uh, most of the physicians would say no. So they uh, don't, they, uh, they are not aware that uh, how big is the influence of their prescri prescribing habits. Uh, I don't know exactly. <laughs> Uh, what to do because uh, you are right uh, that uh, when you deal with conflict of interest you think that's uh, always a problem of someone else and so I don't really know uh, what to do. I think that we should uh, talk uh, and uh, uh, teach during the university uh, courses and so that the students uh, should know that when they will become physician they will uh, have a lot of pressure on their prescri prescribing habits uh, and so uh, they mm, they have to find some way to to combat uh, the, the sort of uh, influence but mm, uh, I, I have no other idea. On the psychology, I'd be glad to send anyone who's interested a list of 30 or 40 articles that have been published uh, detailing the problem of perception of bias. And Farm Doubt has a nice slideshow online on, on uh, mistakes uh, of this, and so does uh, No Free Lunch. On the issue of intellectual conflict of interest, I think it is often used as a distracting factor to disrupt a serious debate. But like a lot of advertising, they play on something that has a germ of truth. There's definitely other things besides financial conflict of interest, and there's bias, and we know that, and we deal need to know it. But the reason that we developed financial conflict of interest regulation in many fields is because it's clear, it's empirical, there's a means to deal with it, and it's very, very important in a society 
that runs a lot on market transactions and there's ways to deal with it. Whereas the other one's l important but less susceptible for rules. So as long as it's not used to stop progress, I don't mind. And let me just give one final example. The medical profession in the US has often said, we have our own ethical guidelines and therefore we don't need law. And that's, that's a real problem. I think if you say, and they're gonna be higher than the law, or we're gonna do something before the law, or in addition, that's great. But if you say, leave it to us, and so don't regulate, I go through the experience of 50 to 100 years to showing how it's um, been a step backwards. And that can be the same situation with talking about intellectual conflict of interest too, if, if one's not careful. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's 10.35, I guess we have to close this plenary session. Uh, well, the first step when you want to solve an issue is, is awareness. Uh, and uh, I think now nobody in that room uh, will be able to, to state in the future that he or she is not uh, aware of uh, the conflict of interest issue. So it is together that we might uh, design uh, some ways to mitigate uh, this uh, issue of conflict of interest. Uh, I would like to thank very warmly our two speakers, Marco Bovio and Mark Rodwin. <laughs> 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 <laughs>